That's where the soul's darkest heart and long to go. Oh, freedom! Oh, freedom! Oh, freedom, I love thee! 1619, Jamestown, Virginia. A Dutch ship dropped anchor with a cargo of black men and women for sale. century, seven million black people were abducted from Africa. The slave trade was one of the world's biggest businesses. Carry me back to old Virginia. That's where the cotton and the corn and taters grow. That's where the birds warble sweet in the springtime. That's where this old darkies hard oh, and oh, In 1860, New Orleans, a prime field hand sold for $1,800. You ask me how it was with us during slavery time? Well, I'll tell you. Everything I tell you is the truth. But there's some things I can't tell you. Sunday. Yeah, that was our best day, wasn't it? That was the only time we had to ourselves. First, we went to the white folks' church, where we sit in the back on the floor. They allowed us to join their church whenever any one of us got ready to join. Or felt that the Lord had forgiven us of our sins. Then the white preacher would ask our mistress and master, what they thought about it, and if they could see any change. I notice she don't steal. And I notice she don't lie as much. And I notice she works better. Then they let us join. We served our mistress and master in slavery time, not God. They used to lock my grandmother up in the seed house when she was a girl, because mm. she wouldn't go to church. And she used to cuss out the preacher so loud that he could hear her. <laughs> Let me out of here, master, she'd say. You want to go to church? He'd say. Hell no, she'd say. I don't want to hear that old sermon. Don't go into your master's hen house, and don't steal your master's chicken. Don't break into your master's smokehouse, and don't steal your master's meat. I don't steal nothing. And I don't need no damn preacher to tell me not to. <laughs> you know, one time, this old white man came along who wanted to preach. So the white folks decided to try them out on us Negroes first. Mm -hmm. 
So he came down to the quarters, and this is what his sermon was. Now, when you servants are working for your masters, you must be honest. When you go to the mill, don't carry along an extra sack and put a little meal in it and a little flour in it for yourself. <laughs> and when you women are cooking in the big house, don't make a big pocket under your apron and put a sack of sugar and a sack of coffee and anything else you want in it. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> they took him out and hanged him for corrupting the morals of our slaves. <laughs> Early 18th century, slave codes were adopted throughout the South. No slaves could leave the plantation without written permission. No slave could strike a white person. No slave could be taught to read or write. The week between Christmas and New Year's, they was allowed as holidays. And we weren't required to work there. And those of us who had families at a distance was generally allowed to spend the whole six days with them. That's right. yeah. 1793. One slave could seed and clean one pound of cotton in one day. Slavery was uneconomical. It seemed to be dying. Any of y'all ever drive the ox? Oh, no. oh, well, now, the mule ain't stubborn nowhere near the ox. <laughs> I tell you, the ox is stubborn and then some. Yes. One day I'm holding fence rails, you know, yes. and the oxen starts to turn G. Mm -hmm. Well, I want them to go straight ahead. So naturally, I call out for the oxen to turn haul. Mm -hmm. They don't pay no attention to me. They keep right on a turning G. And then the overseer, he comes shouting, where you going? And I shout right back at him, I ain't going. I'm being took. <laughs> 1794. Uh, I like one Eli Whitney patented the cotton gin. One slave could seed and clean 50 pounds of cotton in one day. Yes, I, 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 I recall old master told Tom that he couldn't go to the frolic. He, clean up them dishes and go to bed, he say. Tom say, yes, sir. But the master watched Tom through the door. And sure enough, after a while, Tom slipped out and went on to the frolic anyway, with the master right behind mm -hmm. When the master got to the frolic, he found Tom cutting a ground shuffle big as anybody. <laughs> and he said, Tom, didn't I tell you you couldn't come to this frolic? And Tom said, yes, sir, you sure did. I just come to tell him I couldn't come. <laughs> Steam was harnessed to the cotton gin. One slave could seed and clean 1,000 pounds of cotton in one day. My mama told me about a master that almost starved his slaves to death. One time, he had seven hogs, fat and ready for hog killing time. But the day before them hogs were supposed to be killed, something awful happened to every last one of them. A field hand found them and come running to tell the master, the hogs is dead, master, the hogs is dead and we ain't got no more meat on the plantation. When the master got to where the hogs was laying, a whole lot of slaves were standing around, looking sad and hungry-eyed at that wasted meat. Oh, well, master said, what's wrong with him? They said, malitis. And they acted like they didn't want to touch them hogs. And old master said, well, scald them and cut them up anyway, because that's all the meat we're going to have for the winter. Now, old master wasn't about to eat them hogs himself. They had malitis, and he was scared. So he gave them to the slaves to eat. But the slaves didn't mind. Well, they know what malitis was. Early that morning, one of the biggest of them had skidded up to the hog bin and knocked each one of them hogs dead in the center of his head with a great big old mallet. <laughs> and that's how them hogs caught malitis. <laughs> And that's how all the slaves had their belly full of poke that winter, and old master didn't have none.
1859. Two thirds of all slaves were engaged in the production of cotton, the foundation of the southern economy. I knew a woman, mother of several children. And when our babies would get to be about a year or two of age, master would sell them and it would break her heart. Well, when a fourth child was born, she'd just sit and study all the time about how she was going to have to give it up. And one day she'd say, I ain't going to let old master sell this baby. I ain't going to do it. And she got up, give it something out of a bottle. Pretty soon it was dead. You know, Colonel Jesse Cheney, he was my master. And his wife, Miss Sally, was my mistress. She was a Christian. I can hear her praying yet. <laughs> well, just before the war, this white preacher came down to talk to us slaves. And he says, do you want to keep your homes and raise your children and eat? Or do you want to be free to roam around like wild animals? <laughs> he said, now, if you want to keep your homes, you better pray for the South to win. Now, all you all that's going to pray for the South to win, Raise your hands. We all raise, raise our hands. hands. <laughs> we were scared not to. That night down in the hollow, we slaves had a meeting. And Uncle Mac, he stands up and he says, we're going to pray for the South to win. Why? As long as we're in the white folks' church. Oh. But as soon as they turn their backs, we is going to turn them prayers around. All right. That's all right. For each five slaves delivered to the Americas, one died, committed suicide, was shot, or beaten to death on shipboard. You know, Colonel Cheney had a lot of slaves, and all their houses was in a row, all one-room cabins. And clean. Yes. They kept them cabins and yards spotless. Everything happened, happened in that one room. Birth, sickness, death. But it was their home. It looked like a little old town. And late of an evening, as you'd go by the doors, you could smell the meat of frying, the coffee of making, and good things of cooking. You know, the 4th of July was always our special day. <laughs> Independence Day. Yeah, Master and Mrs. give us our rations early on that day. Yeah, and we was allowed to go to a big barbecue after we'd done all the work. We had pigs barbecued, goats barbecued. And the missus would let us bake pies and cakes and custards. The young uns acted like coats, a frolicking in the pasture till they done got so full of vittles they couldn't eat another bite. And after, <laughs> and after you know, some of us would sort of run off somewhere to sit in the shade of the trees. <laughs> when the sun started to go down, then the old folks started getting ready to move on back to their plantations. Mm -hmm. well, we had the chickens to feed. Not to mention the cows to be milked. Oh, hush. Swing <laughs> low, sweet chariot. Come and watch it carry me
1741, New York City. 18 Negroes were hanged, 13 burned at the stake, and 70 sold into the South for plotting to strike at their masters. Come in Every time somebody asks me about slavery and whether it done any good for the race, I think about the story of the coon and the dog that met up one day. The coon said to the dog, well, how come you so fat and I'm so cold and we both as animals? The dog grinned and said, well, I just lay around master's house and let him beat me and cuss me and kick me whenever he likes. So he likes me. He gives me bread right off the table. The coon thought a minute and said, Better I should be free. My pa never had a beating in his life. He was helping the master one day, and something come up between them. And the master say, Sir, you got to have a whooping. Pa studied for a minute, and he say, I ain't never had a whooping before, and I can't let you whoop me now. And the master started at Paul, and he changed his mind because my Paul, like I said, was a great big man. And master say, well, maybe I can whoop you, but I can kill you. And he shot my Paul down, dead. August 1822, South Carolina. Denmark Vesey, a Negro slave, was hanged for having organized an insurrection aimed at capturing Charleston. We had a white overseer, was the meanest man God ever put breath in. One day the field hands was burning logs and trash, and this overseer knocked this old man down for nothing and made us hold him while he beat him with a bullwhip. Well, that old man got up off that ground and took a stick and hit that overseer upside his head and laid him out cold. And then he took an ax and started him to chop off his hands and his feet. We tried to stop him, but it was too late. And Master never wanted a white overseer in that place since that time. November 1831, Virginia. Nat Turner, a Negro slave, was hanged for leading a band of 70 slaves on a 20-mile march, during which 57 whites were killed. This old woman was chopping cotton in the field. And an overseer come by and hollered at her for being so slow. She gave him some back talk, and he took out his long, close wool bull whip and started in to lash her across her back. And that old woman got mad. And she took her hoe and chopped that man to a bloody death. 1859, Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. John Brown attacked an arsenal to capture arms and start a Negro revolt. He was tried and hanged. Whenever one of us died, they let the field hands come in and look at him, but they always buried him before sundown. They take a big plank and bust it in the middle so it could bend back, and then they'd shove his body up in that, and then they'd cart it down to the slave's graveyard and bury it, sometimes so shallow that the buzzards would circle around. My mother had 12 of us children, and it troubled her in our heart, you know, the way we was treated. And she'd pray every night to the Lord to get her and her children off that place. Well, one day she was plowing in the field, and all of a sudden, she let out a big yell and started singing and shouting and hooping and hollering. 
And Master Jim came a running and he says, what's all this going on out in the field? You, you think I sent you out here just to hoop and yell? No sorry, I sent you out here to work. And you better work or I'll put this cowhide across your black back. And my mama, she, she just smiled all over her face. And she said, the Lord has showed me the way. I ain't gonna grieve no more. No matter how you all done treat me and my children, the Lord has showed me the way. And someday, we ain't gonna never be slaves no more. And old Master Jim took that bull whip and started lashing Mama across her back. But she didn't say nothing. She just got up. Went on back to the field, a singing and a shouting. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. April 12, 1861. Confederate troops fired on Fort Sumter. The Civil War had begun. Mine eyes have seen the glory. Of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his they was talking about some kind of animal. But my old auntie wasn't scared. She was glad to hear about the Yankees coming. And she'd sit and talk for hours about how good everything was going to be when the Yankees come. Well, something awful happened, though, to one of the slaves when the Yankees did come. One of the young girls, you know, told the soldiers where Mrs. had her money and jewelry and silver hidden. They got it all. I know she did wrong, but I hated to see her suffer so awful for it. And after the Yankees had gone, Mrs. and Master had that poor girl Huh? Sheriff's army come through looking for Jeff Davis, and they told me that I was free. I didn't have a master and a mistress no more. I helped fix dinner for them, and after that, one of them said, now bring your hat. We gonna pay you. And they passed it, and they give me a hat full of money. I seen all of Wheeler's Confederate cavalry. Sherman come through first, though, and he stayed the whole night. Thousands and thousands of soldiers passed through during the night. The Confederate cavalry, though, was about three days before Sherman, but they caught up with him. But it would have been better if they hadn't, because Sherman turned, whipped them, and drove them back and went right on marching, don't you know? <laughs> oh, Master called us all in the kitchen the day before he we went to war, and he said, boys, I got to go up there and whoop me some Yankees, but don't worry. I'll be back before breakfast. We've been waiting breakfast for that old man for two years. The prettiest thing I ever saw was the Yankees traveling. 
the drums and the kettle drums and them horses. Them horses know their business, too. They had gold bits in their mouths and looked like their bridles was covered with silver and gold. And the Yankees, God bless them, are sitting up there with them long, shiny swords. Pretty sight in this world, I'm here to tell you. We was at Tampa in this great big battle between the Yankees and the rebels, and they was fighting against each other. And, and they were shooting something awful, something terrible, and they were shooting all over the place. And all of a sudden, they struck out that Yankee Doodle song. And a soldier come along and called to me, which way to the rebel? Scared to death I was. So I went behind a house where nobody could see me, and I pointed out the directions. Those were the Union soldiers going after Lee at Appomattox. And the colored regiment come dashing up behind. And when the rebels saw that colored regiment, they put up that white flag. And that flag was the token that Lee had finally surrendered. The end of the war. It come just like that. Just like you snap your finger. How'd we know it? Hallelujah broke out. Oh, freedom! There were soldiers everywhere, coming in bunches, crossing, walking, riding. Everybody was singing. Everybody was walking on a golden cloud. Everybody went wild. We all felt like that, that, that we were heroes. We were free. Just like that, we were free. We seemed to want to get closer to freedom. So we could know, really know, just what it was. It's like freedom was, was a place or a city. And we, we just had to be there, or die. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home.